On July 21st, President Joe Biden announced via social media that he would be dropping out of the 2024 presidential election. In another post, Biden endorsed Vice President Kamala Harris as the Democratic nominee. Following a lackluster performance at the first presidential debate on June 27th, and years of criticism from the left wing of the country, Biden began losing the faith of even some of his most committed supporters. Protests at the White House began following the debate, encouraging Biden to drop out and pass the torch. On July 18th, it was announced that Biden had contracted COVID, causing him to leave the public eye just as the Republican National Convention was starting. The announcement to drop out of the race was made just three days after the conclusion of the RNC, not only taking the spotlight from what was seen by many as a successful convention, but also invalidating much of the anti-Biden rhetoric and messaging the Republican Party had spent so much effort on spreading. Biden addressed the nation during a speech given from the Oval Office on July 24th, his first semi-public appearance since his COVID diagnosis a week earlier. In the address, he thanked the American people, once again endorsed Harris, and focused on the next generation of politicians. So I've decided the best way forward is to pass the torch to a new generation. That's the best way to unite our nation. But there's also a time and a place for new voices, fresh voices, yes, younger voices. And that time and place is now. Biden is the first incumbent president since 1968 to not seek re-election. While it is likely that Vice President Harris will win the nomination for the Democratic Party, that decision will be made officially at the Democratic National Convention on August 19th. For GSU-TV, this is Graham Taylor. On July 13th, former president and Republican presidential nominee Donald Trump was shot at during a campaign rally in Pennsylvania. Secret Service agents shielded him after the initial shot, and counter-snipers shot and killed the assailant, Thomas Matthew Crooks. Though he was hit, Trump was only wounded in his right ear and was immediately rushed to a hospital to receive treatment, where he was released in stable condition later the same day. Three other audience members were also hit in the exchange, with one being killed and the two others critically injured. Crooks was able to climb on top of an unsecured nearby rooftop, where he fired multiple shots at Trump, before being taken out himself by federal agents posted nearby. Security was made aware of a suspicious person in the area due to reports from rally-goers, but Crooks was able to get into position before law enforcement was able to take any sort of action. It is currently unknown whether or not Crooks' motive was politically charged or not. Though he was registered as a Republican voter, little has been uncovered regarding what his motivation was, and no manifestos or similar writings have been found that would indicate why Crooks took the actions he did. Even after conducting over 200 interviews, the FBI is still investigating the incident. For GSU-TV, this is Graham Taylor. The Republican National Convention kicked off on Monday, July 15th in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Over the next four days, former President Donald Trump was officially selected to be the 2024 Republican presidential nominee. Ohio's junior senator, James David Vance, was also selected to be Trump's vice president on the Republican ticket. Trump formally accepted the nomination on July 15th after winning 2,268 delegates, blowing past the 1,215 needed to win. Runner-up Nikki Haley only won 97 delegates. Trump addressed the convention on day one, his first public appearance since being shot at during a campaign rally the previous week. While he initially made calls for unity as a nation, it wasn't long before he was back to his old divisive rhetoric. Other prominent Republicans and guest speakers also addressed the party over the course of the event. While this year's convention was seen as a success by many in the party, the outcomes of the nominations come as no surprise. The Democratic counterpart to the RNC, the DNC, will begin on August 19th and is being held in Chicago, Illinois. For GSU-TV... This is Graham Taylor. Lamar Consolidated School District launched an investigation based off two explicit videos that were shot inside Gray Elementary from a former teacher who admits it was a big mistake. A poor judgment on my part. I would have never I would never do it again. The teacher will not be identified since she has not been charged for the allegations. But she recorded two pornographic videos on school premises showing her body in an explicit manner. If she would do this in the classroom. What else will she do? That followed a news conference by community activists from the new Black Panther Nation calling out her behavior. I had a, a co-worker call me and she's like, H, you're on the news. Former teacher claimed the videos were shot either on the weekends or in a restroom with no one else present. And they were only shared with an ex-boyfriend with whom she had a very bad breakup. I've never sent this out to thousands of men like I'm not that type of person this was just a relationship a private matter and he released it. AHOU legal analyst Carmen Rowe says that the former teacher may be unethical for her actions but not criminal although this is a different story for anyone who shares the videos in any manner 
due to the state's revenge porn statute. Anyone who sends that material out, promotes it for whatever purpose, puts themselves in harm's way and can be charged. And in Texas, we do file these charges and we pursue punishment pretty aggressively. The videos don't appear to be of any children or involving them in any way, but the Texas teacher did resign from the school for unrelated reasons at the conclusion of the school year. She hopes neither her career nor reputation are permanently impacted. This has been Jada Thompson with GSU TV. We were completely caught off guard. 26-year-old EMT Mia Chen and her partner Patrick Femer had just returned back to their station on West 23rd Street after ending their shift around 3 Thursday morning. Chen just coming off of a volunteer double when they say there was a sudden knock at their window. A man approached the ambulance and knocked on our window and informed us that there was a newborn infant abandoned on the sidewalk. The pair jumped into action mode, finding the newborn baby boy right next to their ambulance under the high line in front of the Chelsea building in New York. He was alert, but naked and alone. The umbilical cord was still attached to the child. She was a fresh delivery, so it, it probably happened moments before. The baby was taken to the hospital and listed to be in a stable condition. The EMTs say that the doorman at the nearby apartment building is the one that alerted them of the emergency. When he came out, he saw a clump of something slip on the floor, on the concrete, and he heard the baby crying. He a young kid, he said, oh my God, I never seen nothing like this before. People in the community were shocked, but relieved that the baby will be okay. For GSU TV, this has been Jada Thompson. God, we, we stand on the promise that love will always win. For some, the start of June is filled with joy to kick off Pride Month celebrations. But for the Orlando community, the month is spent remembering the 2016 Pulse nightclub tragedy. Still have a bullet inside of me. This June marked eight years since the tragic shooting that claimed the lives of 49 people and left an impact on the community. I feel so sad because it is horrible that day I was on the floor for three hours. A few dozen people gathered together to join Hernandez along with the Angel Action Wings group to honor those who died some including family members of the victims who called out the names of their loved ones. Some simply wanted to honor the victims. The greatest loss of uh, the gay, lesbian community um, in the history. And uh, it affects us, us all. There's been many changes in recent years. The city of Orlando now owns the nightclub after the One Pulse Foundation dissolved. The mayor has promised to get a permanent memorial done here at the site by 2026. Hernandez has been involved in that process and believes that it is time. This has been Jada Thompson with GSU TV. Storms and heavy rain throughout the month has led to flooding all over the Midwest, which resulted in a partial dam failure in Minnesota on June 25th. The Rapidan Dam in Blue Earth County, Minnesota partially burst, leading to the destruction of a nearby power station, leaving many without electricity. Workers noticed on Monday that water was surging over the dam and that debris was collecting in parts of the structure, adding to the strain. Over 34,000 cubic feet per second of water was flowing through the dam at the flood's peak. When under normal conditions, the flow would only be around 500 cubic feet per second. This culminated in the failure of the west abutment, leaving over 600 homes without power. While the dam did not fail completely, it is still at risk for a full collapse, and local governments are still deciding what action can be taken. While there are no permanent residences in danger of flooding due to a potential total failure, multiple parks and forest reserves near the dam have been temporarily closed. The flooding in the Midwest has so far claimed the lives of two people. Disaster declarations have been approved for some areas, which will allow some of those affected by the floods to have access to federal relief funds. As June comes to a close, the stormy weather is expected to continue into early July. For GSU TV, this is Graham Taylor. On Monday, July 15th, dozens of tornadoes ripped across the Midwest due to a powerful storm front, leading to extended power and network outages, as well as substantial destruction in the area. Over 20 tornadoes so far have touched down in and around northern Illinois, with some even touching down within Chicago city limits. 
The Midwest has already seen an unusually wet summer this year, with rain causing flooding and other issues earlier in the month. The storm system that led to the tornado outbreak began forming Sunday night, bringing six other tornadoes with it, before Monday night's onslaught brought dozens more. Power and internet services in the area were out for multiple days after the event, affecting thousands of individuals, with ComEd working to restore electricity to some residences as late as Friday, July 19th. Many flights were also cancelled or delayed due to touchdowns at both Midway and O'Hare airports. 24 individual tornadoes were confirmed to have touched down in the Chicagoland area as of Monday night, setting a new record for the area for highest number of tornadoes in a single day. While the storms have subsided for now, cleanup in certain areas is still underway. For GSU-TV, this is Graham Taylor. Alexa Stakely, also known as Miss Alexa to so many. The 29-year-old and recent OSU grad was a speech pathologist for Canal Winchester Schools. In lieu of her untimely passing, the school made a heartfelt post to their Facebook page as a tribute to Alexa, with parents commenting on how she helped their kids and their disbelief that she is gone. She had been at Winchester Trail Elementary for five years. District leaders recalled how smart and compassionate Stakely was in ensuring kids thrive in their academics all while being a very dedicated mother to her child. This dedication showed new bounds when she jumped in front of a car to save her son. Police say Stakely was picking up her son from the babysitter on Blue Knoll Drive early Thursday morning. She had just gotten off from her second job and all of a sudden, thieves tried to steal her car. She heroically jumped in the way, but slammed her head on the concrete. She died later at the hospital. Her six-year-old boy now left without a mother. This has been Jada Thompson with GSU-TV. July 12th was a Friday like no other. This Friday was Tube to Work Day in Boulder, Colorado. This tradition started as a joke between friends in 2008, where Jeff and Andy tried to see if they could commute to East Boulder office buildings without the use of any fossil fuels. 16 years and hundreds of people later, this joke has turned into an annual tradition for Boulder residents. It's super fun and just crazy and uh, I love the costumes and just it's a wild event. This event is BYOT and means participants must supply their own tubes, helmets, and closed-toed shoes for the ride. Riders often come in attire that is as loud and splashy as the ride itself. This event shows just how much Boulder has to offer with their proceeds from tubing going towards the local charity, Bridge House. This program seeks to provide programs and services to help with adults experiencing homelessness. Very cold water, hopefully somebody handing out some donuts or something, and uh, just having a good time and hopefully, like he said, not flipping over in the tube because <laughs> it's cold. After a two-year hold due to COVID, this fun event returned in 2022, and two years later, residents still show up to splash around in the fun for a good cause. This has been Jada Thompson with GSU-TV. On Friday, July 19th, some industries across the globe were brought to a halt following a bugged update pushed out by cybersecurity company CrowdStrike. Millions of devices were brought offline due to the issue, causing airlines, banks, news and television stations, healthcare systems, and more to suspend normal operations. The issues arose due to a faulty software update that went live globally at the same time, impacting industries and companies worldwide. CrowdStrike CEO George Kurtz made an announcement on the same day that the cause of the problem had been identified and a fix was being worked on, and reassured customers that the problems were not the result of any sort of cyber attack or malicious action. However, the fix was slow to roll out as it required hands-on support for each individual device impacted, leading to a slower than usual recovery time. In the first few days of the outage, over 3,000 flights around the world had been cancelled, with almost 50,000 delayed, and these numbers would continue to rise in the following days. As of July 26th, CrowdStrike reported that 97% of affected machines were now working again. But even over a week after the outages initially began, some customers and industries are still reeling from the downtime. For GSU-TV, this is Graham Taylor. Israeli Defense Force members were caught on video tying an injured Palestinian man to the front of a military jeep. The incident happened during a raid in the city of Jenin in the West Bank the week before, and video of the incident surfaced on June 23rd. 
The video shows a wounded man tied to the hood of an armored Israeli military vehicle as it passed by two Palestinian ambulances who were unable to help as the IDF soldiers refused to release the man to the medics. The man, identified as Mujahed Abadi, was eventually released and able to be transported to a hospital, but his inhumane treatment prior to that is shocking. This event has sparked outrage internationally, as many continue to pressure world leaders into cutting ties with Israel and to instead provide support for the people of Palestine. Israel has levied accusations of human shielding at Hamas since the conflict escalated on October 7th, but those claims go unsubstantiated, while their own military has now been caught in the act of using human shields themselves. Even though the perpetrators of this particular incident have since been discharged from the military according to IDF officials, it begs the question of what else the IDF is getting away with when the cameras are not rolling. For GSU TV, this is Graham Taylor. History is being made in Denmark, who is set to impose the world's first ever emissions tax on livestock beginning in 2030, targeting greenhouse gases emitted by the country's cows, pigs, and sheep. The plan is to have farmers pay around $43 per metric ton of carbon dioxide equivalent produced by their livestock. Danish officials project this tax to cut the country's carbon dioxide emissions by about 1.8 million metric tons. Danish Prime Minister Yeppe Bruce said in a statement, The agreement shows how much we can achieve when we come together across party colors and interest to find joint solutions to one of the greatest challenges of our time. This has been Jada Thompson with GSU TV. On July 4th, the United Kingdom held their 2024 general election. The Labour Party won an overwhelming majority, and on July 5th, Labour Party leader Keir Starmer was sworn in as Prime Minister. This is the Labour Party's first victory in a general election since 2005 and will end 14 years of Conservative rule in the UK. The Conservative Party, which has been in control of Parliament under former Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, lost 250 seats in the House of Commons. 650 House of Commons seats were up for grabs this election, and the Labour Party now controls almost two-thirds of those seats. The Labour Party's domestic policy is concerned with growing the economy, domestic infrastructure, health care, and education, along with plans to renationalize the railway systems, as well as cracking down on illegal immigration. The Labour Party also outlined 39 bills and other pieces of legislation they plan to pass in the months following this election. This newly elected cabinet will hold power for five years until 2029, when the next United Kingdom general election is held. For GSU TV, this is Graham Taylor. On July 7th, France held its 2024 legislative election. The election was held to select the 577 members of the National Assembly, one of France's two houses of parliament, the other being the Senate, which currently sees a right-wing majority after a recent election. In a surprise turnout, left-wing voters prevented any of the three major political coalitions from winning an outright majority in what was predicted to be a major win for right-wing parties. The new popular front, France's current left-wing party, won 188 of the available seats. The centrist ensemble alliance, which was founded by current French President Emmanuel Macron, won 161 seats, with only 142 seats going to the right-wing National Rally Alliance. All three coalitions, however, were short of the 289 seats needed to secure an outright majority, leading to a hung parliament. While France has had hung parliaments before, never before has control of the lower house been this split. This unprecedented situation could lead to trouble when it comes to selecting a new prime minister later this year, but French law does have safeguards in place to prevent an all-out deadlock. For GSU TV, this is Graham Taylor. Welcome to Hollywood Buzz, your source for the latest in the entertainment industry. I'm your host, Graham Taylor, and today we'll be looking at upcoming releases, celebrity news, and the latest from Comic-Con. Let's get started. Marvel's Deadpool and Wolverine opened on July 22nd to over $211 million in box office earnings over the weekend, hitting over $444 million worldwide, setting a record for highest grossing R-rated opening. The long-awaited team-up between Ryan Reynolds and Hugh Jackman was a hit with fans and finally united the two longest-running Marvel Cinematic Universes, setting up the MCU's next major phase. The trailer for Beetlejuice Beetlejuice was released. 
The sequel to the classic 1988 Tim Burton horror comedy sees Burton once again in the director's chair, with Michael Keaton reprising his role as the titular ghost, and Winona Ryder reprising her role as Lydia. The movie is aiming for a pre-Halloween release on September 6th. Another follow-up to a pre-2000s hit, Twisters, hit the box offices on July 19th, with an opening weekend gross of $221 million. Much-beloved comedian Bob Newhart sadly passed away earlier this month on July 18th at the age of 96. The legendary comedian turned actor had a prolific career stretching from the 60s all the way up to present day, starring in movies and performing stand-up, as well as starring in and hosting his own television shows. Newhart had been battling a series of illnesses in recent weeks before being found dead in his Los Angeles home. Pop star and actress Lady Gaga helped to kick off the 2024 Paris Olympic Games with an unannounced routine during the opening ceremony on July 26th. While she gave a captivating opening performance, technical complications and rainy conditions led to a couple of hiccups during the show. SAG-AFTRA members are once again mobilizing to strike. After a record shutdown due to last year's strikes, voice actors are once again halting productions in order to get more protections from AI technologies that could threaten their livelihoods. The 58th San Diego Comic-Con began on July 25th. The event, which ran until July 28th, was one of the biggest yet, with star-studded reveals for upcoming releases, along with the usual convention fanfare. Marvel teased their upcoming movie projects, with two new Avengers films in production. Avengers The Doomsday is slated for release in 2026, and Avengers Secret War is releasing in 2027. The Doomsday, which will likely follow the upcoming Fantastic Four movie, will focus on the rise of infamous villain Doctor Doom. In a surprise appearance, it was revealed that Robert Downey Jr. would be making his return to the MCU as the supervillain, donning the iconic metal mask. Wolverine. Hey, damn straight it is. Disney brought him back. They're gonna make him do this till he's 90. For GSU TV, this is Graham Taylor. Wilson. Anthony Mackie returns to the big screen, but this time looking a little different. Marvel is set to release their next installment for Captain America, but this time without Steve Rogers. The role was handed to his right-hand man, Sam Wilson, a.k.a. The Falcon, by Rogers at the conclusion of Marvel's Endgame in 2019. You're just a pawn. You may be Captain America, but you're not Steve Rogers. Captain America, A Brave New World, directed by Julius Ona, follows Wilson during the early stages of his new role as Captain America and the difficulties that come along with the job. Wilson must find a way to fulfill the new role while staying true to himself in what's right. This film falls in the fifth phase and sets up for the franchise's next Avenger movie, Secret Wars. You're right. I'm not. Until then, you can catch A Brave New World in theaters Valentine's Day 2025. This has been Jada Thompson with GSU TV. June 25th, 2024 marks 15 years since the death of music legend Michael Jackson. The King of Pop was found dead in his home in Los Angeles in 2009 at the age of 50. To this day, it makes me, every June 25th, they play his music, I, I can't even listen to it because it takes me back to that day when I just, I, I just lost it because I didn't, it was gone too soon. He won over a dozen Grammy Awards and estimated to have sold over 700 million records worldwide. A, B, C, easy as one, two, three, 1970. Boy, my reaction, that was the year I graduated from high school. So that's when the Jackson 5, you know, he hit it with that and Jackson 5 was something in. And my reaction was, wow, this is a nice young group. Michael stole the hearts of many young, being a shining member in his brother bonded group, Jackson 5. Our thing, the blackness, because they were so good and everything sounded so good. The music was so upbeat, the music was so da was dancing. It was just like, they were awesome. Michael Jackson is regarded as one of the most talented performers, being able to sing, dance, and entertain in a manner unlike any other. If it wasn't for Michael Jackson, it wouldn't be these guys moving forward. So he kind of like the pioneer I mean, it wasn't, I mean, I know it was a James Brown and all them, but 
they didn't really get it until they saw Michael Jackson, really. His memory and music continues on through his family and the millions of fans worldwide who were devastated from his passing. I, I play Michael Jackson nonstop. I mean, it's just, and so it, it, I kind of had to pass it down to them, my two boys, so they could know this dude was for real. His music is, he's still king. Yeah, and nobody gonna be better than him. So nobody. This has been Jada Thompson with GSU TV. Lifted to deep left center field. Hamps into the track, and it's gone. Welcome to Sports Talk with Jada Thompson, where you can find the latest stories in the world of sports. Starting off with some news from the All-Star Game and the start of the second half in Major League Baseball. When the games resumed, the Chicago White Sox tied a Major League record with their 14th consecutive loss, which also completed a series sweep for the Seattle Mariners. The Sox have been quite active during the trade deadline and will look to sell even more past the cutoff date. She was shaky. <laughs> this is her third chance, third chance lucky. And the moment that she realizes okay. the very improbable is Barbara Krachikova, the 28-year-old Czech Republican native, took home the title in the women's singles. This was her second Grand Slam title with the victory over Jasmine Paolini. Krachikova can now add this trophy to her championship from the French Open in 2021. Drivers, start your engine! Continuing on to NASCAR, Ryan Blaney held off seven-time Pocono winner Danny Hamlin in the Great American Getaway 400 to secure a win for the second time this season and the 12th time in his NASCAR Cup Series career. Now to Tom, he'll shoot the checkered flag here at Pocono. Ryan Blaney wins again in 2024. Road renowned singer Celine Dion performed at the opening ceremony. In swimming, Team USA took home silver. While in individual events, Bobby Fink also took home silver in the men's 800 meter freestyle. Gold in the team event with strong performances from Suni Lee, Jordan Chows, and Simone Biles.